Thank you, Father, for the privilege and the honor that you've given us to come together this morning and explore your word. We ask your spirit to open our hearts and our minds to the things that we will see here this morning, that they might become a source of blessing and challenge, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> All right, we're starting a new subject. Um, the other one lasted, what, 12 weeks. I don't think this one will last quite that long. <clears throat> Basically, the subject is going to be the uh, uh, Mosaic Covenant or the Mosaic Law, or also called the Law of Moses. Um, the objective here is going to be to get an understanding of the Mosaic Law as it was given to Israel by God. It was a system under which Israel was called to live. <clears throat> and those reference, those terms, Mosaic Covenant, Law of Moses, or just the law, I'm going to be using those terms kind of interchangeably throughout the study. <clears throat> it is very unlike the system church age believers live under in this present age, which we call grace. We're going to begin our study <clears throat> with a very much abbreviated Cliff Notes version of the history of Israel leading up to the giving of the law. <clears throat> so let's look at that. The Mosaic Law did not exist as a system until the Exodus when it was given to Moses on Mount Sinai. Prior to the giving of the Law of Moses, God dealt with individuals on the basis of grace and generally only with a few individuals. But now God was going to be dealing with a whole nation of people, a nation that he had himself created through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. <clears throat> Some moral aspects associated with the law had previously been made known to man by God to govern his behavior. We understand that from the incident of Cain and Abel with their offerings and Abraham building altars prior to the giving of the law, that God had instituted a very basic system of sacrifices. It isn't clear when and how these requirements were issued by God. <clears throat> On Mount Sinai, that fateful day, God codified all of that that had been previously revealed and much more into an organized system. Its observance by the people of Israel, the Hebrews, was a requirement to experience his blessings. <clears throat> God called Israel out of Egypt and the giving of the law, he, and with the giving of the law, he was created a people and a nation for himself through whom he could work and reveal himself and his righteousness. That nation people building process began long before when God called Abram out of the evil religious system in Ur of the Chaldeans and led, them, led him to Canaan, a land he promised to give to Abram and his progeny as a possession forever. <clears throat> this land grant promise is called the Palestinian covenant and is an unconditional covenant meaning their ultimate possession of it would depend completely on the word of God. While they would ultimately possess the land during the kingdom age, their ongoing occupation of it until then was conditioned on their behavior under the Mosaic covenant. Genesis 12, 1, for example, says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, and your kindred, and your father's house, into the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the nations, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Genesis 12 speaks of the Abrahamic covenant and unconditional covenant made with Abraham. Unconditional because it, its fulfillment depended entirely on God and what he purposed to do. 
he would make out of Abraham, uh, Abraham, Abraham, a great nation and would bless those who blessed them and curse those who did not. <clears throat> In you, all of the families of the earth shall be blessed is, of course, a reference to Christ. God later expanded on that covenant and sealed it with the sign of circumcision. Genesis 17, 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. And Abram fell on his face. And God said to him, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations and kings, and I will make you into nations and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout your generation or their generation for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings and the land, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant and you and your offspring after you throughout their generation. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or brought into your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring. Both he who is born in your house and he who is brought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Abraham was old. He had no heirs to fulfill God's promise. So it looked like he might have to take matters into his own hands. At the urging of his wife, he took her slave to be, have a child through her. And she became pregnant with a male child Abraham named Ishmael, but Ishmael was not the one through whom God would fulfill the covenant. Abraham would have another son through his wife, Sarah. He would name Isaac, and he would be the one God would use to continue the line. Ishmael would go on to also father many nations that would ultimately be a problem for Israel, the Arab nations. With the death of Abraham, Isaac became the recipient of the covenant. Genesis 26, 3. <clears throat> Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and will bless you for you and to, for to you and to your offspring. I will give all these lands and I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham, your father. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and will give to your offspring all these lands. And in your offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Isaac had a son named Jacob who had 12 sons and they would eventually father the 12 tribes of Israel. God transferred the covenant to Jacob along with a name change. In Genesis 35, 10, we have this. And God said to him, your name is Jacob. No longer shall your name be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. 
So he called his name Israel, and God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come from your own body. The land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I will give to you, and I will give the land to your offspring after you. And because of jealousy of his brothers, Jacob's son Joseph was sold into slavery, ends up in Egypt, where he eventually gains favor with Pharaoh by interpreting Pharaoh's dream that foretold a famine in Egypt. Joseph devised a plan that would allow Egypt to survive the famine, gaining much favor with Pharaoh, and was appointed to second in leadership in Egypt. The famine comes, and Joseph's family, back in the land of Canaan, seeks to buy grain in Egypt, only to encounter Joseph, who eventually has the whole family brought to Egypt and placed under his protection. They settle in the land of Goshen in northern Egypt as herders, where they prosper for many years. But eventually... That eventually changed with a new administration in government, Exodus 1.8. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph, and he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom, Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of these people from Israel. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves, made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. So out of this oppression, some 450 years now after Joseph arose a Hebrew named Moses, who was adopted into the royal family rose to power in Egypt and was eventually called by God to lead the Israelites out of bondage. What started as one man, Abraham, and his immediate family with a few servants had by then grown to over a million people. Out of that bunch, God intended to build a nation and a people he could call his own and through whom he would work. With the help of God, Moses led the Israelites out of bondage and into the wilderness for what would become a 40-year trek to the homeland God had promised them and was leading them to. To manage them, teach them, and position them for his use, he needed some rules, and those we call the Mosaic Covenant or the Law of Moses, since Moses was the recipient of the law directly from God. Exodus 19.1. On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came to the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There, Israel encamped before the mountain, while Moses went up to God. The Lord called him, called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. 
Three days later, Moses was called back and he was given the Ten Commandments to present to the people of Israel. In Exodus 21, all the way through the end of the book of Exodus, we have a whole series of revelations concerning this system or covenant God was making with Israel with details for government, a legal system, a system of worship, details for the construction of the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, priestly vestments, etc. That's followed by more details of the various offerings and expounding on the laws in the book of Leviticus that follows. The system was elaborate and extensive. And if that were not enough, the Pharisees later piled on all manner of man-made minutiae. Some 600 and something rules were added to the law. That has been a very much abbreviated history up to the receiving of the law. Now we're going to begin to <laughs> the details of the law itself. The first thing we should understand about the law is that it is a covenant between God and his people who will be called Hebrews. Specifically, it will be a conditional covenant, meaning the two parties to the covenant Israel and God, each have responsibilities under its term. God promises to bless Israel if they meet the terms of the covenant and discipline them if they do not. This is detailed in Deuteronomy 28, and it's worth your time to go read it to understand this. This potential discipline, including being expelled temporarily from the land, but ultimately the land would be theirs in the kingdom age as promised unconditionally by God. Until then, their occupation of the land was conditioned on their behavior under the Mosaic covenant as spelled out in Deuteronomy 28. Exodus 19.7. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. So Moses presents the terms of this covenant to the Israelites. And note their answer. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Prior to this, they were under a system of grace, and they should have said, no, we want to stay under the Lord's unmatched grace, but they didn't. They boasted they would do all they were called to do, and of course, they failed miserably. There was no universal indwelling of the Holy Spirit prior to the church age. There were many examples of people being endued with the power of the Holy Spirit, the temporary indwelling and enablement of the Spirit prior to the church age. But that was restricted to certain individuals through whom God was working to accomplish some purpose. Examples would be Adam and Eve, Noah, Moses, Abraham, Joshua, later the prophets, some kings and judges during the age of Israel, and the artisans tasked with building the tabernacle and later the temple, along with all of the articles of worship. <clears throat> the Mosaic law was intended to be kept by the power of human effort alone. That was intentional to teach man that experiential righteousness is not possible without divine enablement meaning the indwelling and subsequent empowerment of the Holy Spirit, which would become universal for all believers during the later church age. Before we go any further, anyone have any questions or thoughts or comments they want to add to this? Yeah, I had an interesting point brought up in, in our study uh, was, you know, we're just hitting Pentecost in Acts 2. And I didn't know this. I haven't gone back and verified it. I'm reading some commentary that states this. But 
actually the mosaic, mosaic law was given to Moses 50 days exactly after, at, Passover. after Passover. And the Holy Spirit was given to the church 50 days after Passover. So one was given of the law that we couldn't follow. The other one was given us the spirit, which gave us the power to follow God that we didn't have when they gave us the Mosaic law. So I thought it was an interesting contrast from the Old Testament to the New Testament, both a 50-day period from, from uh, the Passover, and both are two entirely different views. One, a law to follow. The other is by grace, and the Holy Spirit leads you, and the law is no more relevant. Uh, it's in your heart from that point forward. So I thought it was an interesting contrast as we went through this, and I just bring it out for a general comment. When I taught on the Feast of the Lord, I taught that. Mm -hmm. uh, not the part about the contrast, but I taught it from the perspective of, in both cases, it's God revealing himself. Right. Under the law, he's revealing himself through the law. Under the church, he's revealing himself through the Holy Spirit. So yeah, it's a good point. I hadn't thought about the contrast that you mentioned. That's, that's interesting. Okay, moving along. <clears throat> Let's begin our exploration of what exactly was involved in this system. I remind you that the Mosaic law was given to the entire nation of Israel, including believer and unbeliever alike. It is divided into three parts that in English translation are called the Decalogue, the ordinances, and the judgments. We also refer to these as three codices. Codex number one is the Ten Commandments or the Decalogue. These commandments form the basis for freedom in Israel. The Ten Commandments define freedom in terms of human activity. There can be no freedom without morality, which must be fulfilled by both believers and unbelievers alike in, if the citizens of the nation are to have the freedom to live and conduct business in safety. The Ten Commandments define human freedom in terms of morality, privacy, property, life, and authority in general. They define human freedom under two categories, relationships with God and a relationship in interaction with people. While some sins are mentioned in the Ten Commandments, its purpose is not to define sin. The sins mentioned are intrusions upon privacy, property, and freedom. Human freedom must live and prosper under proper authority. And this authority is defined in two areas, human volition as the basic authority in life and establishment or government authority summarized by the 10 commandments. All right, let's look at them. That's Exodus 21. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And you have no, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers. <laughs> on their children, on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord shall not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days, you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is Sabbath to your Lord, your God, and on it you shall not do any work. 
you or your sons or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the soldier who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord, Lord rested the seventh day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false, false witness against your neighbor. You shall not cover your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. All of the rights of a group of people must be defined in terms of personal authority. Everyone is responsible in the framework of freedom to follow establishment rules. These, when these rules are violated, we get crime and loss of freedom for even the law-abiding citizens. I think we're seeing the failure of this system all over America today when there is a weak or no moral code of conduct in a society and couple that with the failure of government to enforce laws, you get anarchy. And it, that is exactly what we have in some jurisdictions in America today. Punishment is described in the law. Criminals have the right to use their free will to recognize these rights and principles or not. If not, there are consequences to be paid. Other factors include good manners, thoughtfulness of others, and regard for women. On the other side of volition, establishment authorities are set up to guarantee freedom. For example, the authority of the husband over the wife, parents over children, and government. You shall not defines in negative way what morality is. Morality is the system whereby freedom permeates the human race. Morality is a requirement for the entire human race, not just believers. Something much higher than morality is required for believers, and that's virtue. And the highest form of virtue is spiritual maturity. Matthew 26, 36 through 40 sums up the entire law. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all of the law and the prophets. Imagine how nice it would be in a society that believed and followed the simple rule of life. Codex number two. Codex number two is the ordinances or the spiritual code. If you have freedom from the Ten Commandments, you are then free to hear the gospel and accept it or reject it. This emphasizes the fact that believers are designed to function under both the laws of divine establishment as well as Bible doctrine in the soul. The ordinances are the spiritual heritage of Israel. They are the theological code designed to present Jesus Christ as the only Savior. The spiritual heritage of Israel includes a complete but shadow soteriology and Christology, the essence of God, and the explanation of justification in terms of divine integrity and all of the adjustments to the justice of God. These doctrines are communicated both through ritual and through oral teachings. The ritual communications include directions for the construction of the tabernacle and its furniture, the delineation of the holy days, the function and operation of the Levitical priesthood, and the significance of the Levitical offerings. All of these things spoke of the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ in shadow form. The ordinances are means of communicating the gospel. They are also a means of appreciating the salvation the Lord has given to
to all of us. Codex number three is the judgments, the establishment code or the national heritage of Israel. That is its unique inherited sense of family identity, the values, the traditions, and its culture. This includes all of the political and functional heritage of the nation Israel reduced to writing oral communications and government modus operandi. This includes an elaborate system, an elaboration of freedom and authority, privacy, rights, property, privileges, marriage and divorce, military policy, taxation, diet, health, sanitation, quarantine, criminal law, trial, punishment, laws of evidence, and capital punishment. The responsibility of government is to ensure freedom. The Mosaic law has everything necessary for ensuring the freedom of its citizens. It defined the concept of jurisprudence, which distinguishes between criminal and civil law and developed the laws of evidence, which include here, exclude hearsay and assign just punishment for criminal acts and tort for criminal law. No one could be convicted unless there were two or three witnesses who independently before the court, court presented the same facts. Criminals were punished immediately. The principle was that punishment must be so severe it restrains the criminal. Part of the establishment code is capital punishment, which was first enucleated in the scriptures, Genesis 9, 5. For your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning from every beast I will require it and from man. From his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of a man. And this was incorporated into the Mosaic law. Exodus 21, 12. Whoever strikes a man so that he dies shall be put to death. And then in number 35, 30, if anyone kills a person, the murderer shall be put to death on the evidence of witnesses. But no person shall be put to death on the testimony of one witness. And this was transferred to the church, Romans 13, 3. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Codex 3 included a system of taxation. Tithing was simply a system of taxation and was levied on both believers and unbelievers in Israel under the law. There was a separate system of offering for believers only, and the offerings of believers were not assigned any percentage. There are, were three income tax systems in Israel. There was a 10% income tax for the maintenance of the Levites. That's found in Deuteronomy 18, 1 through 5. The Levitical priest, all the tribe of Levi, shall have no portion of the inheritance with Israel. They shall eat the Lord's food offerings as their inheritance. They shall have no inheritance among the brothers. The Lord is their inheritance, and he promises them and this shall be the priest due from the people. From these offerings, a sacrifice, whether an ox or a sheep, they shall give to the priest the shoulder and two cheeks and the stomach, the first fruits for your grain and your wine and your oil and the first fleece, fleece of your sheep. You shall give him. For the Lord your God has chosen him out of all of your tribes to stand and minister in the name of the Lord him and his sons for all time. And then Numbers 18, 21. To the Levites, I have given every tithe in Israel for an inheritance to return for the service that they do, their service in the tent of meeting, so that the people of Israel shall not come near the tent of meeting lest they bear sin and die. But the Levites shall do the service of the tent of, of meeting and they shall bear their iniquity. 
It shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations and among the people of Israel, they shall have no inheritance for the tithe of the people of Israel, which they present as a con contribution to the Lord. I have given to the Levites for an inheritance. Therefore, I have said to them that they shall have no inheritance among the people of Israel. In Leviticus 27, 30, every tithe of the land whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the trees is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. If a man wishes to redeem some of his tithe, he should add a fifth to it. And every tithe of herds and flocks and every tenth animal of all that pass under the herdsman's staff shall be holy to the Lord. One shall not differentiate between good or bad, neither shall he make a substitute for it, and if he does substitute for it, then both it and the substitute shall be holy. It shall not be redeemed. So there was a 10% income tax for feast and sacrifices as well. Deuteronomy 12, 22. You shall tithe all the yield of your seeds that comes from the field year by year. And before the Lord your God, in the place that he will choose to make his name dwell there, you shall eat the tithe of your grain, of your wine, of your oil, and the firstborn of your herd and flock, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. There was a 10% income tax gathered every third year for the poor of the land, Deuteronomy 14.28. And at the end of every three years, you shall bring out of the tithe of your produce in the same year and lay it up with your towns. And the Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance with you, and the soldier, the fatherless, the widow, widow who are within your town, shall come and eat and be filled, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands that you do. Malachi describes this in income tax evasion, Malachi 3.8. Will man rob God? Let, yet you are robbing me, but you say, how have you robbed? How have we robbed you in your tithes and your contributions? You are cursed with a curse for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Being the full tithe, and bring the full tithe to the warehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test of the Lord of hosts if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you blessings until there was no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will be not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in your field shall not fail, but bear, says the Lord God of hosts. Then all nations will be called, will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. So great blessings were promised to Israel when its citizens faith, faithfully paid legitimate income taxes. Tithing under the law calls for giving 20% annually plus another 10% every, that should be every three years. That means if you say you tithe according to the law, then you must be giving 23 and 33.33% 33, uh, a year, plus spiritual giving on top of all that. Oh, that's a bit more than 10% a year, isn't it? Spiritual giving does not have a percentage associated, assigned to it. The church age, like church age giving, it is as the Lord moves you to give and not limited to a tithe. While spiritual giving is mentioned, it is not an issue in the establishment code of the Mosaic law. In the spiritual code, the offerings of a believer is a private matter between the believer and God. No percentage is specified. Charity is always a valid part of the spiritual life, both in the Old and the New Testaments. The laws of divine establishment, marriage, family, and government, are for believer and unbeliever alike. Morality mandated by the Mosaic law was for both believers and unbelievers. It was not the means of spirituality. Morality is not spirituality. Spirituality is infinitely greater 
than morality. Morality is produced by human self-determination and is good, but spirituality is produced by God the Holy Spirit and is infinitely greater than human moral good. Next, we're going to take two side strips, side trips. And the first will be develop this idea of a doctrine of divine establishment. So that concludes the organized portion of our lesson today. Let's have a little chaos. Anybody have any questions or comments? And one of the things that come up when I'm just get, getting your, your input on this is the, what you just described was a form of taxation that actually runs a nation. What you describe is should be United States tax law and where the portion of our taxes are allocated by our politicians. As you describe that, that's what I see. On top of that is tithing for other purposes other than running the government, charity, uh, part of the poor process seems to be part of the taxation the government should be allocating towards the poor, the, the, the widows, the orphans. Uh, that should be going specifically to them from that. But offerings to, to build a church or to feed people who had a disaster, those are charity offerings which are outside of the taxation code. Is, is, that a, is that a valid way of looking at this, or is that just what I came out that's probably, no, none of that's really valid, what I said? I don't think you can overlay the Mosaic Law on U.S. government, for example. Um, there are some aspects of it, the concept of freedom, um, and we're going to get into that next, next week. Um, a little bit and how um, establishment codes <clears throat> um, define and protect that and are valid in, in all generations. Keep in mind though, th there's a big difference between the way the law was set up and any other system subsequent to that. And the big difference is the law, Israel was originally set up to be a theocracy. God was the president, so to speak. And so this was designed around that concept of dealing with God. The modern governments should have respect for religion. And we'll get into that in a, in a later uh, study. But modern government should not look like what we just saw under the law. There's some similar aspects that we should see and observe because they're valid and good for all forms of government. But the US government, for example, is not a theocracy and it should never be treated like one. But our, our forefathers for this nation obviously used the Bible to govern our laws and our processes for our government today. Now we've gotten away from it, I understand that. But originally, when you go back and look at, look at the research of our forefathers, we're very much driven by the Bible and our laws and our codification of the laws uh, initially. And, and some of those are obviously still in that. Now we've gotten away from a lot of that uh, here in the last few, probably 20 years. But I just found it interesting as you went through this it, was that a model that our, even our forefathers thought <laughs> that we should be laying out our taxation and where these taxation dollars should be allocated for the running of a nation according to God's will? That's just something that went through my brain if you laid this out. Probably not, not valid. Yeah, our, our system of taxation is certainly flawed. And, um, and yeah, we could probably do better if we looked a little closer at the law. But understand that a lot of that taxation went to the maintenance of the Levitical priesthood, which we don't have in this country and we shouldn't have. Um, but yeah, it's, 
you're right. The founding fathers were um, by and large believers. And even those who were not really, I hate to use the term religious, um, even those who were not actively Christians had a clear understanding of uh, divine establishment principles, which we're going to get into next week. And they built their go the go this government on those divine principles. And um, unfortunately, we have gotten away from that. Lane, when he's, you read back there, he said, uh, we told Abraham, I'll make you the father of many nations. What does that mean? Why did he say that? Wow. Well, why did he say that? Yeah, it's a question. Though. Well, Abraham, out of Abraham's seed came two primary seeds that would respond to that or produce what he was describing. There is a seed from Isaac, which would ultimately result in the nation of Israel and the Israelites. And then there was the seed of Ishmael, which would ultimately result in the many nations of, that surround Israel, um, the Arab nation. So I suppose when God was saying that, he was referring to the fact that out of those Abraham's seed, those two seeds would produce many nations. That answer your question, Dennis? Uh, I, I would say, too, that he's the father spiritually of many nations. That's true. Maybe not physically, but spiritually. Aspect of Christianity it, you know, permeates everything. Yeah I, well, <laughs> yeah, I don't see many nations that I would say spiritually follow Abraham. I mean, there's a reason God said it, but I, I don't. Most governments are corrupt, and I wouldn't say that they were Abraham's children. Well, you know? well, today they're corrupt, but they, they were not years ago. Yeah, yeah. I think the main thing be... on that was, was not so much spiritual, but on physical, and describing the nation of Israel and what would become, for example, Saudi Arabia and Jordan, Jordan and Syria and Iran and Iraq and blah, 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 blah. So that's the, the ton of nations and understand then too, in the context of this, we're talking about a very localized um, area of the earth. The rest of it was generally not known. And Lane, Lane think about it, that um, Abraham's disobedience resulting in Ishmael or his lack of faith resulting in Ishmael created all those nations which now stand in opposition to Israel, direct opposition. Yep. Yeah, he didn't say you would have many righteous nations <laughs> through your offspring. He just said nations. Could also refer to the 12 tribes of Israel. It was one nation, but divided into 12 different nations. <clears throat> No, but the, the the Arabs, the Arabs and the Jews all go back to him. Yeah, a lot of people that came out of one man. Anybody else have any questions or comments? I have one, Lane. Um, you commented that. Prior to the covenant with Israel or the Mosaic covenant, that the people were under grace. Um, I don't, I mean, the only covenant before that you got sort of the Abrahamic, or the, I mean, the uh, Adamic or the covenant with Adam, which is if you, then you will die. And it apparently, Everyone after that lives under that covenant until 
the unconditional covenant, the new covenant with Christ. So how is, what is the, what is there under grace prior to the covenant with Israel? I don't, I don't understand where this grace comes from. It seems like everybody's under death, which is part of the covenant with Adam. Well, even we're under that, aren't we? Say again? I say even we are under that, aren't we? Well, until we you say that we're under believe grace. and become in Christ, yeah, everyone even today would still be under this death result of that covenant. Um, <clears throat> prior to the law, there was no formal tit for tat um, covenant between God and mankind uh, that spelled out life to the extent that the law spelled it out. Um, there was grace uh, prior to that in the sense that um, in a sense that, that God dealt with man and blessed man um, according to God's desires a will to bless man. And it was not a requirement for man to perform some specific task in order to receive God's uh, blessing. Lane, would, would a way to say that, and I'm just throwing this out to, to try to get to Charlie's question, is you're using the word grace. Oh, I would almost substitute the word faith. Noah was a faithful man. Uh, God, we were up under those that were faithful. Who was faithful to God, God blessed uh, through grace. But it was the grace was obtained through they being faithful. And maybe that's not the right way to look at it. But I look at everything prior to the Abrahamic code, and it's judged upon the person's faithfulness. Oh, uh, more than because there, there, there were no written codification laws. So maybe that's the wrong way to look at it. But I think that's a very good way to look at it. And thank you for that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Prior to the law, God dealt with men, men who were uh, faithful and expressed faith in him leading and guiding and giving them whatever God promised he was going to give them. That's exactly what we do under um, the church age. We express faith before to God, and God rewards or uh, gives us what he promised he would give us because we have faith that he would. The faith generates God's grace. Yeah. Right. Uh, that's how I'm trying to link yeah. these together for Charlie. He said, Grace is tied to faith. That's salvation too, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Yeah, that's an excellent what, answer. Thank you. What I find interesting is we started with Ten Commandments, and actually, I don't know how many are in the Old Testament, uh, whether the Pharisees added more or they were expressed 613 in the Old Testament. But anyway, we started with 10. They were negative. And you could keep them to some degree. Uh, do not murder, do not commit adultery until Jesus brought the heart into it. And then that kind of broke it up. Well, Jesus went from 10 to 2. And he went from negative to positive. And he brought love and heart into it, which made it totally out of reach. There's no way you can keep the two commandments that he brought under any condition. So it put man right at a standstill. It's either faith or you're going to die. You can't keep, you can't love God with all your heart. You can, might love LSU football with all your heart, but not God. And you can't love your neighbor as you love yourself. You don't even love your wife or children as much as you love yourself. They put it out of reach purposely. Well, it, it is out of reach and it is not out of reach. You're right. Personally, individually, uh, 
for me or you or anyone to love God and to love your fellow man is not possible. However, we in the church age have the uh, indwelling empowerment and empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And if we walk by means of the spirit, we shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, Galatians 5, 16. And then further down in Galatians 22 to, uh, 5, 22 through 23, we have the nine, what we call graces, that are called also the fruit of the spirit. What's the first one? Love. And that's not our love. That's not personal love. That's not the lovability of the uh, our fellow man, because our fellow man is not very lovable, right? In most cases, that is God's love that the spirit of God produces in us and that we, through the filling of the Holy Spirit, which means the word filling means filled to the point of overflowing, that's that filling of the Holy Spirit, God's love flowing out of us. It's not our love. It's not personal love. It's divine love based on integrity. It's a gothy love. Yeah, exactly. But, but it's no longer love. It's no longer law. Now it is God's grace. Yep. The, the law has become obsolete. Yeah, that, that's something so superior that it disappears. Christ Jerry, I, I, I've heard it said for what it's worth is Jesus brought it down to two laws, right? Yes. After his crucifixion and his resurrection, he brought it to one. And that is believe. Believe in me. So we went from we went from 600 to two to one. Yes. Yeah. Uh, my brother said it best I ever heard it. I don't know if it was he heard it somewhere else. He said the law is like the steering wheel of your car and Jesus is the road. If you stare at the steering wheel, you're going to go in the ditch. But you keep your eyes on the road, and you're, this takes care of itself automatically. The steering wheel does. You don't think about it when you're just driving. You take your eyes off of the road, just stare at the steering wheel, you, you, you can't make it. And I, I thought that was really good. Yeah, that's a good analogy. Keep your eyes on Jesus, not always. <laughs> yeah. Not on your performance. Right. Yeah. Jesus said that he'd write his laws on our heart. And I, I take that as when I put my trust, when I bring God into my situations, he'll tell me which way to go. He'll, he'll help me decide what I ought to do. You know, he said he'll write them on my heart. When we do wrong and we know we did wrong, you know, or that's just my opinion on that. I think it's really big when he said, I'll write my laws on your heart. I think he meant it. It makes them instinctive. Mm -hmm. You don't need something blessed. written on page. You know it in your heart what you should and should not do. And you have and a conscience. Dennis, and when Dennis takes over, it, it doesn't go right. <laughs> <laughs> when all of us take over, it doesn't go right. Nice. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Right. Great session, great kickoff. Good lesson. Yeah. Uh, Lane, I, I got some. Very good, Lane. One, one more thing right here in, in Galatians. It says, uh, to see, by preaching the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with the believing of Abraham. We're talking about blessing a bunch of nations. So maybe that's what that father of many nations was talking about. Uh, yeah, you're probably right. The but, he, but he's literally the father of many nations. Yeah. All right. That was good. Thank you. all That's good. Let's close with a prayer then. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come to you now and give you thanks for your precious word and all of the marvelous things that you left there for us to discover and for us to use in our soldiering through life. We ask that your spirit be with us, to guide us, lead us, 
open our hearts to the truth. Convict us when we're wrong and that we might be witness for, witnesses for you in Satan's world. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.